Well, we turn in God's Word this morning, and I want to focus your thoughts on the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, chapter 31. And I'm just going to read the first three verses, but it's verse 3 in particular that is on my heart to speak to you this morning. Jeremiah 31, we'll read verses 1, 2, and 3. At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest, the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, have I drawn you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. When I was asked if I would consider coming to preach God's word among you uh, for three or four Sundays, my mind went to the wonderful theme of the love of God. And I want to explore that with God's help with you uh, as we uh, move on together for a little while. Now, our Lord tells us that as the end times come, many things will take place. One short phrase with far-reaching consequences is used by our Lord in Matthew 24. The love of many will grow cold. I don't think you need me to repeat that. The love of many will grow cold. And I sense that that is the situation in many, many churches, in many individuals. And I have to confess that from time to time, I find it has to be said even of myself. And our Lord tells us why that is so. As he goes on to say that the love of many will grow cold, yes, because lawlessness will abound. A departure from the ways of God causes our love to grow cold. And again, you don't need me to explain that. And then our exalted Saviour, he writes a letter in Revelation chapter 2 to the church in Ephesus through his servant John. And one of the charges that he has against that church, Revelation 2 verse 4, he says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And as I was pondering these things, it came to me like this. It is good for us, and we do well to examine our own hearts and our own lives in this matter. Lest God should say concerning you, and I'm not going to be pointing fingers at anyone, lest God should have to say concerning me, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So with God's help, I want to look at this great theme of God's love and ours, with the objective, and there's always an objective in a preacher's mind, and my objective is, that we should stir up our own love. Now you say, oh, I can't do that. I know you can't. But that's the objective, that our own love should be stirred up for the Lord and for each other. And that will draw us closer to him and it will draw us closer to each other. 
And we need that closeness, don't we? Oh, for a closer walk with God. Yes, and a closer walk together. It will be for our good. It will be for our glory, for God's glory. And that we might all then be lost in wonder and in love and in praise. And I want to begin by ask, asking the question and answering it. Where does love come from? Where does love come from? Love's beginning is the title for our message this morning. Love's beginning, where it comes from. We need to know that. It's so important. And I suggest to you this morning that God's love begins with him. God's love begins with himself. And when we begin to grasp that, we'll grasp something of the wonder of his love for us. Let me remind you, God is eternal. God is eternal. In other words, he has no beginning. He has no duration. He has no end. After all, how does the Bible open? In the beginning, God. God was there before anything began. Therefore, he had no beginning. And all that is created came from him. He spoke and it was done. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Therefore, if nothing exists without God making it, he can have no beginning. In his great self-disclosure to his people, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said to Moses, You shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you to them. Do we not read in Psalm 90, verse 2, 93, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting you are God? Or in Psalm 93, you are from everlasting. And furthermore, Scripture plainly and importantly tells us that God is the unchanging God. He is the God who has no beginning or end. He is an always constant present. And he does not change. He never increases. He never decreases in any one of his great attributes. And each of those attributes of God, for the sake of you young folk, what do I mean by an attribute? I mean a quality of God, something about God. Every attribute of God impacts on the others. Did he not say, I am the Lord, I do not change? Has he not said, through James, that in him there is no variation, no increase, no decrease, no one day of warmth and another day of cold. There is no variation, no shadow of turning with him. So when I read in 1 John 4 verses 8 and 16, three simple words that God is love, it's not that God has loved, or not God will love. He is love. If you just think about that, how wonderful it is. There's never a moment 
when God is not love. In all his dealings with us, he is love. And the standard of his love is constant. When we love one another, our love can grow cold. Then the one that we love does something very special and our love grows warm again. Not so with God. Because he is the unchanging God, his love is an unchanging love. <coughs> he always has been, always is, and always will be love. So, what does our text say? I have loved you with an everlasting love. A love that had no beginning, duration or end. I simply love you, he says to his people. It's not going to increase. You're not going to do something and make me love you more. You're not going to do something else and make me love you the less. My love is everlasting in all its constancy. Now I realise that that is something certainly I can't fully grasp and I'm sure none of you can either. It's beyond our understanding. We can't get hold of such a thing. And it should thrill us, shouldn't it, this morning? It should move us to worship our God for we join with the psalmist, don't we, brothers and sisters? This is our God. Not just for now, not just for the Lord's day, but forever and ever. He's not going to change. And all the love that we receive begins with him. So we must consider who it is that this God loves. Who does he love with this everlasting love? Now we must be very careful. We must be quite explicit and clear at this point. Our text in Jeremiah says, I have loved you. Oh great, he loves me. But just a moment, just a moment. Let's be clear. And let's be biblical. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, but who is he referring to? Well, verses 1 and 2 give us the answer to that question. At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. In the context in which this phrase is used, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Clearly, the prophet is referring to God's covenant people. God's covenant people are loved with this everlasting love. They are all the families of Israel, the covenant people of God. My people, the people that belong to me, the people that I have redeemed, the people that I have saved, they belong to me. And I have sent my son to save them and to bring them home to me. My covenant people. They are those who come from the line of Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, the families of Israel. That's sim a simple and clear understanding of what is being said. Those embraced in the covenant, in the covenant God made with the patriarchs, beginning with Abram, and then Abraham. Abram, the high father, became Abraham, the father of a multitude within the covenant that was subsequently confirmed to Isaac and to Jacob. This is what God said. 
I establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. There's that word everlasting again. Everlasting love towards the people in the everlasting covenant. To be God to you, the patriarchs and all that flow from you and your descendants. And I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, and here it comes again, an everlasting possession. Loved with an everlasting love, within the framework of an everlasting covenant, that they might have an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Is this God your God? Is he your God this morning? But we could put it another way. It is covenant people, but in verse 2, they are the objects of God's grace who are loved in this way. They are the people, thus says the Lord, chapter 31, verse 2 of Jeremiah, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest, they found God's grace. They came out of Egypt. They travelled through the wilderness. They came into the land of promise. And what did that require? What did it require for those ancient Israelites down there in the, slave, in the bondage of slavery in Egypt? How did they come out of that position into glorious freedom and into the land of promise? They were redeemed. God's redemptive work in the Passover sacrifice and in the events at the Red Sea when God intervened for his people and set them free from slavery. How did that happen? The Passover. What was that about? The shedding of blood and coming under the blood. And thus they were set free. And what happened at the Red Sea? They were hemmed in on every hand. And this great God intervened for them, made the way open so that they could go through the sea. Yes, to enter into the wilderness experience. But what happened there in the wilderness? This is the people that experienced God's protective care and God's leading through the fiery, cloudy pillar. That pillar of cloud that was with them day and night. When it was stationary, they rested. When it moved, they moved. A wonderful story, but such a thrilling story because it's prefiguring. It is demonstrating to us what was going to happen a few thousand years later when the Lamb of God came into the world and went to the cross and shed his blood for the redemption of his people. But they didn't only, weren't only redeemed, they weren't only watched over in their journey and provided for, but they received the gift of God's holy law on Mount Sinai summarized in the Ten Commandments. They were given a standard by which to live, all within this glorious covenant framework. Now, what had happened in Jeremiah's time? Well, they had departed from God. They had turned their backs upon this God. They had turned their back upon his word. They had turned their back upon his ways. And they were reaping the consequences in their exile in Babylon. And yet, and yet, in due time, in God's grace, this is a people who found grace. They found grace when they came out of Egypt. They found grace when they were in Babylon. Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
and Daniel all refer to a period of 70 years, don't they? After 70 years are completed at Babylon, says God, I will visit you. I will visit you afresh. And I will perform my good work towards you and cause you to return to this place. You will come back to where you should be, in the promised land. They were the objects of his grace. And they still are the objects of his grace. Is it not amazing that God should love such a people with an everlasting love? A love that he had before, towards them before they even existed, that showed itself in his grace and mercy to them as they existed, and brought them into a land that they had not known before. But there's something even more amazing than that. Because God made a new covenant, didn't he, with the families of Israel? A new covenant superseding the old. We read about it in Jeremiah. We read about it in uh, Hebrews. We read about it in this very chapter that I've just taken my text from. If you go to Jeremiah 31 and verses 31 to 4, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with this house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts, and so on. And it concludes in verse 34, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Still a covenant expressing God's love. Still a covenant that arises out of his grace but now embracing both Jew and Gentile. As Peter picks up on the day of Pentecost, the promise, the covenant, is to you, you Jewish people in front of me, and your children, and to all who are afar off, to you and your children, the Jewish nation, all who are afar off, the Gentiles, and then he opens it right out, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Friend, is it not a wonderful love that loves people who have turned their backs upon him? A people who need redeeming, and he's provided a redeemer, a people who need directing and in love he guides them. A people who have needs at all sorts of levels and who says, I will supply all your need. It's an amazing love. It's a covenant love. It's an everlasting love. And that brings me to my last point this morning. It is this love that underpins the gospel. Consider again the glorious truth of our text. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore, therefore, something is consequent upon this. With loving kindness, I have drawn you. I will build you. You shall be rebuilt. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines and go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. What a wonderful love this is. Because of his everlasting love, God acted and moved and still acts and still moves because there's no, no change with him to save sinners 
Is that not an amazing thing? How many of us this morning can say, yes, he acted and he moved in that everlasting love to save me. The most unlovely one of all, he moved to save me. Do you resonate with that statement? How did he do it? How did he do it? <clears throat> we remember that God is a trinity. God the Father chose us. He determined in love who he would save. He chose us in Christ with a great intention that we should be adopted into his covenant family. We should be brought in, the outsiders brought in, to receive the covenant blessings of the gospel. Oh, it's in love the Father chose us. You read the opening verses of, of Ephesians 1 and you'll see it all there. And in his everlasting love, he gave his Son, the co-equal, co-eternal, second person in the glorious trinity he gave him that people and said to his son go down into that world and redeem them go down into that world and save them go down into that world my son take a human body to yourself and go and lay down that life go and come under my wrath and my curse on the cross at calvary to procure their salvation and it's all driven by this everlasting love. And isn't that exactly what he did? He came, he lived, he gave his life, a ransom, a redemption price for many, transcending the Jewish nation and embracing every individual within the covenant of grace. And having done that, what did he do? He rose again for our justification. He rose again that God who sent him should be able to say they are not guilty. Their sins and the consequences have been taken away from them and dealt with and cast behind me forever never to be seen again. And still, it goes on. This love is so transcendent. In his everlasting love, God the Holy Spirit does something. You see, the Father doesn't do something, and the Son does something, and the Holy Spirit sit back and watch it happen. No. The Holy Spirit, in his everlasting love, comes and works in our hearts and our lives. What does he do? He brings home to our hearts with life-giving power the truth of the gospel. He seals home to us the fact that we need a saviour. Do you realise you need a saviour this morning? Is it a burden upon your heart? Oh, if only I could be saved from my sin and from its consequences. My friend, the remedy is clear and the Holy Spirit comes to those who cry out, Oh, help me in my sin. Forgive my sin, deal with my sin, take the consequences, O oh God, away from me. I can do nothing towards it. The Holy Spirit will come and he will bring you to that place of repentance and to cast yourself, a helpless sinner, on the mercy of God that is seen and revealed in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And when he brings you to that, what does he do? 
He seals that salvation home to you. Oh, friend, if you've received those blessings, the everlasting love of God is upon you. And it will never increase, it will never decrease. It is a holy, infinite constant. That salvation accomplished by God the Son, at the God the Father's command, is yours. And God the Spirit has revealed it to you. Now as soon as we grasp that, something happens. Because of his everlasting love, who gets the glory? God does. Why does God exist? For his own glory. Why does he do anything? For his own glory. Why did he create all things? And why does he provide for all things? For his glory. Why does he save a sinner? For his glory. And ultimately, of course, for their good as well. But he gets the glory. The Father is glorified. The Son is glorified. The Holy Spirit is glorified. And one day we shall be glorified. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Why? Because he called them. And why did he call them? Because he foreknew them and he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn, the chief, the one who gets all the glory among many brethren. But whom he predestined, he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. And why will Christians be in heaven? Because they've done something good? Because they've done this, that or the other? Not a bit of it. They'll be there because of what he has done. And what will they be doing there? Giving him the glory. Oh, friends, that God may have all the glory. And the flip side of that is, because of his everlasting love, God gets the glory. Now wait for it. We get the blessing. We get the blessing. Oh, what wonders love has done. It glorifies God and gives us the, all the blessing. He has blessed us already in covenant and one day in the fullness with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's what love is. That's the everlasting love. And with loving kindness, he draws us to give us those blessings. We'll see you next, next Lord's Day morning, God willing. The, what the appropriate response should be to that everlasting love. But for now I leave you with a question. A question that Jesus put to Peter. Do you love me for loving you? If you do love the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, rejoice. Yes, all around you is giving way, but rejoice. Rejoice. You are the objects of God's everlasting love. You've been drawn in his loving kindness to the Saviour and now every spiritual blessing is yours. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling in its mighty ocean, in its fullness over me, underneath me, all around me is the current of thy love leading onward, leading homeward to my glorious rest above. But if, my friend, this morning you do not love the Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you to pause and to think, what does that mean for you? If you are without Christ, you are lost and you are lost forever. But today, the call the call of the gospel comes to you. 
Do not spurn it. He came to save sinners, the likes of you. And he says to you, come unto me, you who are laboring and heavy laden, burdened with your sin, I will give you rest. I will give you the peace. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. Are you restless this morning, longing for rest? Are you unlovely this morning, longing to know something of someone's love? Then come to Jesus Christ. You will find rest for your very soul. Come to him in humble repentance over your lack of love. Has your love grown cold? Come to him afresh. His love does not grow cold. There's a welcome in the arms of Jesus Christ. Seek his forgiveness for the one who comes to me, however unlovely, however cold their love, I will by no means cast out. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we praise you this morning for such everlasting love and pray that there may be those responses in our hearts. Perhaps we've grown cold in our love, but we've found, as Wesley put it, strangely warmed by these glorious things. Oh, that it might be so for each one in this congregation, for your glory and their good. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>